This is an example showing scope for parameters in C and C++. And we've got two examples for that, as well as some additional comments afterwards. So uh, first is a sample program called scope.c. We've got the output up at the top of the program, and then samples of the different parts of the code uh, here. The first step is to isolate the different sections of code so that we can look at them independent of each other. And uh, we'll just put a box around each of these sections of code. And, you know, if, imagine you had a big cardboard box down at the end of an alley or something. If you're inside the box, you could look out if you had some holes. But if you're outside, it's hard to look into the box through those holes. So we'll use that same principle here that if you're in a box, you're looking for a variable and you can't find it for a variable name, you can look outside of the box, but you can't look into a box. And then, of course, we have global scope around all of this stuff. There we go. <coughs> Up at the top here for global scope, we see we have variable x, and that starts out as the value 1. And then we go down into main for the rest of it, and we'll zoom in just a little bit uh, to make it a little bit larger, so we can keep track of what's happening. So, I'm going to pick up down here in main. So, first thing in main, I've got a value for x is equal to 3, and uh, then starting the scope program, that would be output for this. And in fact, up at the top, we can see they're starting the scope program. That's the output statement. And then we call function 2. So, let's keep track of function 2's call. So that takes, it takes us up right here to function 2. We have a value for x is equal to 5. <clears throat> Output statement of x. So we print out the value for 5, and then we do the plus plus. So 5 prints out, and then the plus plus is done after that, <coughs> which changes the value to 6. And so the 5 is printed out. So if we take a look here for our output, there's a 5 that gets printed out. And uh, this change value of x that goes to 6 um, then changes, after we do this, changes to 0. But notice that this change is not reflected back. These are not reference parameters. In fact, there's no parameters here. It's just side effects from function 2. So we come back. We're done with function 2. Now we're going to go on down here to function 3. Let's keep track of the fact for the call. Come into function 3, no parameters, but there's a local variable x. And that is initialized to 10. And then we have a print statement where we print the value of variable x, and after that we do the increment. So it prints out 10, and here's our output statements. There's the 10 that gets printed out, and after it gets printed out, x goes to 11 because of the plus plus. And then from here we call function 2. So one function is calling another function. And we just keep track on, on the call stack with the memory model of our computer of which uh, where we go back to when we come back. So function 2, we come up here to function 2. This is now a second time they're calling function 2, so I'll put a different color here just to keep track of that. So maybe we'll say that this is green. And function 2, we call it a second time, which gets its own version of x, which is 5. Prints out that value for 5, and then 5 goes to 6 because of the plus plus. Here's the output value. It prints out to 5, and then it goes to a 6. And then x equals 0, goes to 0. And then we come back to where we had come from, which is right here. So then we finish with our call to function 2. And then we go on and we call function 1. And so for function 1, that's this code up here. So for function 1, it prints x. Now, remember our rule that you can look outside of a box, but you can't look into a box. So we're inside this box here, and inside this box, there's no x parameter, and there's no x declared as a local variable, so we have to look outside of the box. When we look outside of the box, we see this value of x that was initialized to 1 when we first started the program. So that's what gets printed out with that x. We print out the value of 1, and then we do the plus plus after that. So here's the 1 that gets printed out. And then we do the plus plus on that, so that 1 then becomes a 2. And then we have the statement of setting x to 0, which would, again, be that x sets it to 0, like that. 
So from function one, we came from here, so we go back, we finish that. There's no more lines of code down below. So we return from function three, and in function three, right down here, that call, we're now done with that. So now we have this printf statement, and we print the value of x. Well, that's the x that's in the box here, and after we print out the value of x, which is 3, then we do the plus plus, which is going to set it to 4. So up here at the top, we have our output of 3, and then that gets set to 4, and then press any key to exit. So this, instead of system pause that we use for dev C++, this is a way to write our own version to have our output pause. So this would work on either dev C++ or on a regular Unix system. So just showing how uh, we can call one function, have that function call other functions, and how we have to keep track of scope for variables. Another issue is a confusion between names. So this is called scope 2. So same thing, we'll start by drawing boxes around the different sections of our code. So let's do that. Uh, where'd the bottom of the code go? It looks like it cut, got cut off down here. So that would be our closing statement for main. And then we have function 3, function 2, and function 1. And then, of course, we have the global scope for the program, which is the whole thing. I want to avoid global variables, as the statement mentions here. And, uh, you know, I want to make this just a little bit bigger for the global scope. There we go. So up here then for, uh, I'll zoom in just a little bit more. There we go. And when we start out our program, we have here x is equal to 3, so a value for x is 3, y is equal to 5, and z is equal to 7. Start with those variables, and then we go down into main. So down here inside of main, we can see that we have a variable for answer. Starts out at 0, and we have x. Starts out at 13, he's down here, and y starts out at 15. So, did that, did that, and then we come down to our printf starting scope sample program, and so then we have the output starting scope sample program. That's where we get that output right there. And uh, then we have another printf statement in main, x, y, and z are these following values, and it's going to print out 0. 13 and 15 for x, y, and z. So x, y, and z, 13, 15, and 7. Just as we can see right there, x, y, and, sorry, and z. So where is z? Well, z is not local here. There's an x and a y that are local, 13 and 15. But where's the z? There's no z here, so we have to look out which is the 7. So that's where we have 13, 15, and then that value of 7 there. That gets picked up and printed out. And then we make a function call f1, and we're going to send it x, y, and z, which are the values 13, 15, and 7, as we just saw. So we come up here to f1, and we're going to call this multiple times. So let's keep track. This first time will be blue, and we get... Um, so we're passing in order x, y, and z are 13, 15, and 7. And remember when we pass, we pass and catch according to order. So the first one get passed is 13. That gets caught here. Never mind that it was called x down below. And that's being called y up here. Okay. And the second value to be passed was... 15, and that 15 is going to be caught right here. So here's 15. And then the 7 goes up here into Z. So we have these local values, 13, 15, and 7, and then we do um, a plus plus on all three of them. 
So this becomes 14, x becomes 16, and z becomes 8. Local variables inside of this function. So then we print out print number 2 inside of function 1, and we print out x, y, and z. So notice this middle one is x, so that's 16, 14, and 8 that gets printed out. 16, 14, and 8. And we see that there. There's a 16, 14, and 8 that get printed out. So now we finished our call to function 1, f1. So we're done with this call right there. And then now let's print out what our current values are with this print statement right here. So after the call to f1, so this is the third output statement, x, y, and z are, and we're going to have x, 13, y, 15, and z is still 7. So 13, 15, 7. And so here we go. We have 13, 15, and 7 are still the values for output. By the way, if you go on the website, course website, uh, you can find um, these things. And that's bit.ly slash um, CS141, I believe is the website. Let me just double check that. Bit.ly slash, let's see here, CS141. Make sure that that's correct. Yeah, bit.ly slash CS141. There it is, right there. Um, if you do go to that website and you wanted to find this code, you could come down here to Notes and Reference, C++ Notes, and then under C++ Notes, we could go down to Functions, and under Functions near the bottom, uh, we could find this information. So um, these confuse parameter programs are ones that would uh, give us something uh, very similar to these programs here that we're looking at. Okay. Um, let's see now. So we just finished our call to function f1 right there. And that's, that's why I use this notation by putting a little box. If I have to get distracted, I can keep track of where I was. So I was right there at that... Uh, at that spot, and so now we're done with function f1. We do our printf statement here for 3, x, y, and z, 13, 15, and 7, as I mentioned just a moment ago. So statement 3, 13, 15, 7, yeah, there it is, we already did that. And now we're here for a call to Function 2, where now we send it the value x, where the value x has a 13 in it. So we're sending the 13. So we're going to come up to function 2, and we're going to catch a 13 with that. And then we have some local variables that are declared here. So we've got x is 0, y is 2, and z is equal to x plus y. So x plus y, 0 plus 2 is 2, and so z is equal to that. So 13 goes away, and we have the 2 there instead. And now our print statement here for number 4. Inside of this function, x, y, and z are, and we print out x, y, and z, which are going to be 0, 2, and 2. So we print out 0, 2, 2. So this is our output, 0, 2, 2, right there. And uh, so we are done with function f2. And then we have another printf statement um, in, which is right down here, in f1. And we print out x, y, and z again just to see what's going on. And x, y, and z are still 13, 15, and 7. So then we have that output for 13, 15, and 7. We see that's still there. Uh, then the last portion, looks like that that got cut off here. Um, hang on, let me go and, and find that bit of code, or maybe I can just figure out what that was. Three. Um, 13. 
So it looks like here we had a call. It looks like my brace was wrong. I had F3 of X right there was the next thing that I had. Um, and then let's see what came next. I think that's it. Yeah. So sorry about that. That got chopped off at the bottom here. So we finished that one already. So now we're here. F3 with X. Um, so we go up to F3 and we catch. Um, so X down below is this value of 13. So we send a 13 and we catch the 13 right there. It says inside of F3, right here, the number and x are displayed, these two variables. So number is 13 and the value of x, there's no x declared in here, so we're going to look out. And if we look out up above, we can see the value of x is 3. So this is going to print out. going to print out the 13 for the number and 3 for the x. So 13 and 3. And in fact, that's what we see here in our output statement. And then we say um, number equals x plus plus. So num is this local variable equals x plus plus. x is 3. So num equals x. So the value of 3 goes into num. And then the plus plus changes the value of x. So having x and the plus, af plus plus after it means first you use that value of x. And then you do, after you use it, then you apply the plus plus to it. So we took the value of x, which was a 3, stored it into num. And then we did the plus plus on it. Now I don't know what I just did here. Uh, I think I just went up to the top of the program. Hang on, let me come back down where we're supposed to be. My apologies for that. Here we go. All right. So we were, uh, where were we? Uh, we're right here. Num equals x plus plus. So get the value of x, which is 3. And uh, store it into num. So that's where this 3 came from right there. And then we do the plus plus, so that value of x becomes 4. So we finish with that statement. And then this print statement down here for number 7, site F3, we print out the value of num, which is now 3, and x, which since there's no x declared in here, it looks out here, and it's going to print out 4. So we'll print out a 3 and a 4. And that's, in fact, what we see here for our print statements. And then we're done with our program. So it's helpful to think about something like this that could be a little bit convoluted and where one function calls another function, the names of the parameters are different. And in addition, sometimes the parameters could be reference parameters, sometimes they're value parameters, so you have to keep track of all that. So another couple of examples here that illustrate reference parameters in both C++ and C. We're going to do the C++ version first. Remember in C++, if you want to make something a reference parameter, all you have to do is put an ampersand in front of it. So we're going to do the same thing we did with our previous program, um, and that is to just draw a box around these functions to just help us keep track of them. So there's that first one. And then here's this second one. This program is aptly called Confuse. And then inside of main, similarly. And do we have any global declared variables here? We do not. So that's all we need for these. So inside of main, we have these integers to begin with, a, b, and c. So here we go, a, b, and c. Now, since this is C++, we know the default values are C. doesn't really matter here because the next statement is setting A, B, and C to 0 explicitly. So we're not depending on default values. Okay. And then here we print them out, and we have A, B, and C, and all three of those 
our zeros. So that's that output right there. Then we call confuse1 and we send it a, b, and c. So confuse1 and we send all three values, which are zeros. There they are. And then we set these values a is equal to 1 using this code right here. b is equal to 2, c is equal to 3. And then we have an output statement where we print out a, b, and c, which are 1, 2, and 3. So here's the 1, 2, and 3. So we're done with Confuse1. So we finished all the statements here in Confuse1. So we go back to where we came from, which is down below here. And when we print out the statement A, B, and C, and notice those are still these values that are unchanged of zeros for output. Next, we call Confuse2, and we send again A, B, and C. So here's Confuse2, and we send these three zeros. Notice, however, now we've got these ampersands, so these changes are going to be reflected back when we do our trace. We have to make sure we come down here and update these changes when we return. So A equals 1, so really I could be writing it down here, but it's easier to do it locally and then copy it back down. B equals 2, C equals 3. So A, B, and C are 1, 2, and 3. There's 1, 2, and 3. And since these were reference parameters, when we return, these changes do get reflected back. And we have 1, 2, 3, like so. So that's it for Confuse 2. Sorry, that was 3. Um, and then we print out after the call A, B, and C, R, A, B, C, which are the values 1, 2, 3. And this program, again, is on the course website if you want to run it yourself. And now we call confuse 3 and send ABC, which are the values 1, 2, 3. So we're sending 1, 2, 3, and we catch 1, 2, and 3. Notice that I've renamed these. They're no longer ABC. I have C, A, B there. So A is equal to 3. So where is it here? Here's A. That's equal to 3. That's a statement right there. B is equal to 1, and C is equal to 2. Okay. And inside A, B, and C are, so here's A, 3, B is a 1, and C is 2. So 3, 1, 2 are the values. So we print out 3, 1, 2. There's the 3, 1, 2 that gets printed out. Now when we return from here, notice that it's just the first value and the third whose changes get reflected back. So the first one, C, corresponds to A. So A gets changed, was a 1, now it's a 2. And then the third one also has an ampersand. That corresponds to C, so that gets changed. So C was a 3 and now becomes a 1. So then I have 2, 2, 1 that gets printed out. So we're done. Um, see, where are we? Did we finish? So we're inside of Confuse 3. Inside of Confuse 3, uh, now I'm confused. Um, I think we already did that, it's original values, but we're just talking about what gets reflected back. And this one, and this one get reflected back. So we get our 2, 2, and that, so that's already done. We get our 2, 2, 1 with this print statement right here. And that's our last output. I'm trying to move fast because I know it's a lot of little details, um, but when you're looking at it and not actually writing it down. You can probably think about it more quickly. So that's an example of confusion. And if we do the same thing now in C instead of C++, we've got the same output, same issue, uh, basically the same program. Let's see if we can compare. The second one has all three reference parameters. The third one, only the first and third have reference parameters. So let's take a look. Is the same thing true here? It is. So it looks like really it's the same program. So you're going to get the same output. If you have questions about how that works, um, I suggest that you go through and step through the code and think about it. Remember our three rules. You pass with an ampersand, catch with an asterisk, and use with an asterisk like that. So otherwise, it's the same example, just different notation for the code. A few other comments on functions that I would like to make. 
Uh, first one has to do with function overloading. So let's say that you have uh, uh, get weekly salary. right? So if I have my hourly rate and number of hours worked, so I can multiply those two to get my weekly salary. But what if I just wanted to do this, 8.25? So then I'd have two versions of weekly salary, one of them that catches a double and a int, and one of them that catches just a double. So let's take a look at how this would work um, to have some function overloading. So it's the same name, but your what's called the argument signature is different. So the argument signature is the name of the function and the number and types of parameters. Notice that it does not include the return type. This is an important distinction. So if you have two functions that are identical, except for they have a different return type, then in fact there's going to be confusion. The compiler could get confused and not tell them apart. So function overloading exists in C++, but not in C. This is tricky for us because we're using C++ compilers, but we are thinking about both languages and trying to understand and learn both languages. So let's take a look at this running with, with overloading. So in our case, we're, we have a function to average numbers. And this first one averages two numbers, returns the average of those two numbers. And then the second version of the same average function that returns an int receives three integers. And in this case, these three are averaged and returns that value. So when we start our program down below here, we find the average of two numbers and print that out. And the values are two and eight that we're using. And then we find the average of three numbers and print that out right here. So the average of two and eight, two plus eight is 10 divided by two is five, should be the output. And the average of four, five, and nine, so four plus five is nine, plus nine is 18, divided by three should be six. So we have our output of five for the first line and six for the second line. Let's go and take a look and see what we get. Here we go, compile and run. So average of 2 and 8 is 5, average of 4, 5, and 9 is 6. So it's the example how same name of a function which would be illegal except for the fact that they've got different number of parameters or different types of parameters or both. So when we're looking at this, we're thinking, well, it should be nice to just have one function called average that could do both of them or something similar. And in fact, we can do that with default values for parameters. So let's take a look at the explanation for a moment for this. So this works in C++, but not in C. So the default values must be rightmost in a parameter list. Um, and in some situations where the declaration is before the definition, so you have the headers basically, so that you can put main first and then your functions after that, then the defaults would be in the declaration, the part at the top, and not the part with all the guts of the functions in it down below, which is the definition. So let's take a look at a sample program um, that has to do with uh, uh, wages again. Let's take a look here. Default parameters. Okay, so now we're returning double, and the function is called total weekly salary. And so I have uh, the hourly wage, but I am supplying with an equal sign the default value. So if I were to, and then similarly for hours worked. Now, if I leave, if I want to use the default for hours worked, then I can just leave it off and the default gets supplied. But I can't try and get the default for this one and then supply that one. You can't. You have to remove from the right. So down here, when we get totally weekly salary, we're using default values for both of them. So that would be default value of 40 for hours worked. And... 8.25 for hourly wage, and we'd get the sum, uh, the product of those two. Down here, for this total weekly salary, um, I'm showing that I'm supplying this value, which is the same as that one, but then I'm changing number of hours worked. So you might think, well, why don't you just put a 60 there and leave this off? Well, unfortunately, you can't do that. You have to, um, if you want to supply, change the second one, you have to have a placeholder for this one for whatever value it is. So here this is going to be 8.25 times 60. And then lastly, if I do leave this one off, the default of 40 gets supplied and filled in for hours worked. 
and then here in this case ten point fifty ten dollars fifty cents becomes the default hourly wage so if we run this program we can see what it does and here we have the answer for for these products which is in fact what we expected for them All right, that's it. Enjoy. I hope this makes sense to you, that you can think about functions, parameter passing, scope, how it can be potentially confusing if the same name is used in multiple places, and I hope you've got that all straightened out in your head.